This is Paula Hammond, who's an institute professor and department head of chemical engineering at MIT, uh, small Boston University, so whatever. Go ahead, Professor Hammond. Thank you so much. And it is a real pleasure to join this really distinguished group to talk about my own experiences in engineering and uh, opportunities uh, for impact that it's uh, led to. Uh, we were told to describe a little bit about our own experiences. To mention that I am from Detroit, Michigan, uh, my hometown, and I grew up uh, with uh, a great joy for uh, pulling things apart, including plants and leaves and uh, uh, anything that you could find on the ground. Um, I was raised with my two brothers, a younger and an older one, so I was a middle child. Uh, and the uh, bro my brothers do very different things. My older brother is an urban planner and my younger brother is a poet. So between the three of us, we cover just about every field and area. And I had a fantastic uh, experience with my parents. Uh, my father was a, um, a PhD in biochemistry and uh, one of the few uh, PhDs at that time uh, who were black men. Uh, he got his degree from Wayne State University, which is how he ended up in Detroit. Uh, and my mother uh, was a nurse uh, who essentially launched a nursing program at Wayne County Community College and thus became an educator. And uh, as I began to uh, think about what I wanted to do with my, my life, I became very excited about the idea of chemistry and the possibilities of making new material systems. Now, in that process, I ended up at MIT, which was really a, a big transformative experience for me because it gave me an opportunity to learn how I can uh, essentially apply these basic principles of chemical engineering to design new things. And uh, as I ultimately uh, went back to MIT, both for my PhD and the later became a faculty member, uh, I began to use polymers as a primary means of generating new material systems. And some of my earliest funding uh, was from the National Science Foundation, uh, which included work on the use of polyelectrolytes of opposite charge to build thin films. So that was my career award, uh, in which we, I was looking at how we could form patterns and control these interactions. But later I began to look at how these materials might assemble in solution. And some of our earlier work actually focused on synthetic polypeptides that were highly uh, functionalizable using click chemistry and using those synthetic polypeptides to create responsive micellar systems that could carry drugs. Um, so I thought I'd uh, give an example of the work that we do in our lab by describing our work using layer by layer nanoparticles for cancer therapies. In this case, we take a nanoparticle, one that is already uh, uh, generally FDA approved, for example, a liposome, which is already the carrier that we use for doxol, or PLGA, uh, a degradable polymer. We can incorporate a chemotherapy drug inside that core, uh, and we can then design the nanoparticle so that it is able to carry a second drug. For example, if we put down on a negatively charged core, a positively charged layer, and then uh, a nucleic acid, we can incorporate that negatively charged nucleic acid um, that's going to be our second drug cargo. And typically we would look at siRNA, particularly ones that would silence a, tums, a tumor's uh, genetic defense mechanisms so that we can be resistant tumor responsive to therapy. Um, we then sandwiching by putting down another positively charged layer. And now we have a protective encasing of the nucleic acid, uh, but positive charge does not work well for nanomaterials that we inject into the bloodstream because they will get rapidly opsonized or uh, taken up by, um, by monocytes. So we need a, a layer that is going to actually disguise the nanoparticle from recognition by tumor cells, at least to some extent, and allow it to uh, remain in the bloodstream long enough to accumulate in the tumor. So with that, we use a stealth layer, and that stealth layer is a strongly negatively charged polyelectrolyte that is hydrated. Um, in that sense, 
we can actually um, use a number of known native materials. And this is what these systems look like when we drape them in these uh, alternating layers of polyelectrolyte. We can create uh, an outer layer that is that can not only contain drug, but can ultimately guide the nanoparticle to specific targets. And in our case, our interest has been in how we can design that outer layer to uh, essentially have specific binding to cancer cells. So uh, we think about this as a way of putting together multiple cargoes, which gives us the idea of like the Wonka gobstopper where you uh, dissolve away different layers and in each one you release the new flavor. Um, in our case, siRNA plays that role. Uh, and we did a great deal of work looking at these kinds of nanoparticles to target lung cancer and triple negative breast cancer. Ovarian cancer is a slightly different case though. Uh, first of all, there aren't a lot of known siRNA targets that are highly effective, at least uh, um, well examined or explored, that address high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And although this is the cancer that is fifth among cancer deaths in women, there hasn't been very much progress made over the last 30 years. Typically, they're very subtle, if any, symptoms. And that means it's often discovered in very late stages, third and fourth stage. And by that time, it's highly advanced. It's undergone a lot of genetic modifications. So typically, of that group of people who um, are treated with a primary chemotherapy uh, treatment and surgery, about 70% of patients respond. Out of that group of 70, a large number of them will have recurrence. And that recurrence will happen a little bit further down the line with a highly resistant and metastatic form. And uh, because this is a very difficult and resistant form, it would be wonderful if we could train the immune system to recognize these tumor lesions before they even begin to grow. But it turns out ovarian cancer is not very responsive to common immunotherapies. So in doing this work, we first set about looking at the outer layers that might allow us to target a nanoparticle specifically to older cells. And we did this by uh, taking a liposome, which is uh, our, one of our favorite nanoparticle pores, uh, gives us a lot of versatility. We absorb a poly polymer known as polyallarginine, which is uh, uh, a native uh, synthetic poly, it's a synthetic polypeptide from a native amino acid. And then we put down many different kinds of negatively charged outer layers. We created a library of these different outer layer chemistries, negative charges from carboxylate and from sulfonic groups and a range of different polymer structures. And we looked at their association with specific tumor. And in our case, we found that there were three formulations that have a very high affinity for ovarian cancer cells, but a very low affinity for other healthy cells. And uh, these nanoparticles all tended to give us high association. Here we show an example uh, where we can see the tumor uh, gives us this uh, green luciferase signal. And the nanoparticle, after we have injected the nanoparticles into the intraperitoneal space, accumulate very strongly with where the tumor was. Not only that, but when we have uh, metastases uh, to the intestine, we also see that the metastases also associate with the tumor. Now, it turns out that depending on which of these outer layers we choose, uh, we end up getting uh, no particles in different parts of the cell. So, for example, hyaluronic acid goes on the inside of these cells, whereas uh, polyalbutamic acid tends to associate on the outer surface membrane, and polyaluspartic acid gives us some sort of in-between behavior where we get uh, association on the surface, but then slowly we see uptake in the core in, of the cell. We also know that these undergo different mechanisms of association and that different outcomes for our nanoparticle. So uh, we began to really focus on hyaluronic acid for siRNA and chemotherapy delivery. But we were interested in this polyalbutamic acid system because the nanoparticle is bound to the surfaces of these cells. Uh, so if we look closely at that, it, it means that the nanoparticle does not get into the very uh, low pH endosomal compartments of the cell. Instead, anything that's released is released to neighboring cells and is not exposed to that low pH. And that's a great condition to release a protein, which can get degraded at low pH and release that protein to neighboring cells. So this turns out to be a great mechanism to cause tumor cells to release 
a protein that will ignite the, the immune response in immune cells that are nearby. And what we found is that uh, a cytokine, for example, IL-12, which has been studied for uh, a long time as a possible means of addressing cancer, is a potent stimulator of the immune response because it causes these uh, immune cells to generate interferons, including interferon gamma. And interferon gamma uh, then signals T and NK cells to arrive at the site and essentially begin to uh, give us a tumor-specific tumor immune response where we get essentially tumor killing. The problem, of course, is that although this is really interesting, IL-12 is a really potent molecule and it initiates an immune response against any cells uh, that tend to be nearby. Uh, so we don't want to deliver this in the bloodstream as a need protein. It turns out in clinical trials that led to huge toxic autoimmune effects and therefore IL-12 is not used currently as a treatment. So we thought, can we make this work in ovarian cancer by encapsulating these cytokines to the surfaces of our nanoparticles and then coat them with a positive and then a negatively charged layer, one of the, the layer that we identify clings to the surfaces of these ovarian cancer cells. And uh, the idea then is that when we do this, we would rescue the toxicity of the IL-12. We get rid of it. So we looked at the health of animals and we dosed with IL-12 directly, and we see with these red arrows, these are the loss of life that we saw in our animals over time, as well as the weight loss. However, when we looked at our nanoparticles IL-12, we no longer saw loss of life, and we also saw that uh, we were able to maintain the weight. When we looked at survival of the animals, here we're looking at uh, how rapidly this ovarian cancer model leads to death in our mice. However, when we treat with uh, our IL-12, we see that we see immediate loss of life, a couple of animals are lost, and then the rest survive for a slightly longer time. With the IL-12 formulation in our nanoparticle, we find that we're able to eliminate that toxicity-related death, and we're able to exp the survivability of these mice, and in some cases, 30% of them, uh, we got full recovery. We've been able to refine this technique and have actually improved those numbers. Uh, and we have formulations that are giving us 60 to 80% uh, now in terms of recovery. And they meet the re-challenge when we introduce them to tumors and introduce new tumors to those same mice that have been cured the first time. Uh, so essentially we found that these are wonderful systems to incorporate multiple drugs, singular nanoparticle, that we can tune surface chemistries to allow these nanoparticles to either act as agents within the cell or act as shown in this picture as delivery agents that deliver cargoes from outside of the cell through the innate interactions of immune cells and cancer cells. And uh, we can leverage different kinds of cell types to the tumor microenvironment. So um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that uh, this is just sort of one piece of the kind of work that we do in our lab but our lab has evolved incredibly. We began by working on fundamental principles of polymer science and self-assembly. And a lot of that work was funded by the National Science Foundation. And it was that work that led to our generation drug delivery systems, as well as a number of other applications. Uh, we ended up getting funded then by the NIH and the Department of Defense to carry out uh, those more uh, applied uh, areas of research. One of the big things that I really felt I benefited benefit from as a researcher is the opportunity to train other researchers. And I feel like I've had so many brilliant and uh, amazing people in the lab. And what's really exciting is being able to see them evolve and develop their own ideas and take the research in a new what graduate school really enables and what postdoctoral experiences really enable. And here you see uh, some of the snapshots of uh, members of my lab who have gone on to become independent, independent investigators and are running research labs of their own and now mentoring other uh, young scientists. And there are many ways to have impact in uh, this field and I feel very lucky to have had a number of those, um, way, uh, a number of those experiences. Um, these are pictures taken from our uh, National Science Foundation uh, MRSAC program is one of the things that we participate here at MIT in, as well as our MIT uh, Minority Summer Research Program, 
uh, there have been, uh, I, I think at this point, something like uh, 80 or 90 students who have been through our lab at different points in life. And our hope is that we are inspiring those students to continue to move on to do science. Um, but I've also had a great experience with my colleague who's also here, Dan Arvizo, uh, in uh, helping on a national level with the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST. And here we show a snapshot of the group of um, meeting at the White House. And I've also had the chance to have some input on the direction of science by sitting on boards, such as the Science Advisory Board at Moderna. I apologize for the background noise. And uh, participating in workshops, such as the future faculty workshop shown here, which is designed to help uh, uh, students, especially from underrepresented groups, uh, understand the ins and outs of applying to and becoming faculty members. Uh, this is just a, a final snapshot of a, an adventure that I had in 2009, in which we to engage in a, uh, uh, a road trip across Africa, uh, a, a group of researchers looking at ways in which we can help improve the crop, the harvest for African farmers. Uh, and we started in Kenya and went across Kenya. This picture is taken in Kenya. And later had the chance to go to Ghana and look at uh, harvest there uh, and think about how technologies might be able to develop cheap ways to enable farmers to bring their uh, crops to harvest. So um, hopefully there's time for questions. And I'm sorry if uh, I went over a little uh, bit, find out from our moderator. No, you, you, well, first of all, thank you for a wonderfully inspirational talk. I mean, everybody obviously cancer either directly or indirectly impacts all of us. The question I have is kind of a nerdy question, which is um, how much of the work that you do is in the Petri dish, if you will, versus you know computer modeling and, and how good are the models? And as you look forward to making more progress, um, which way do you see this going or perhaps both you know, in the Petri dish, but also computer modeling? That's a wonderful question. Uh, until recently, all of our work was in the petri dish, dish the, um, the chemical hood, and uh, the animal um, facility. And those were our sort of primary areas of work and impact. Uh, but very recently, we actually uh, did a study, which was just published in Science a couple of weeks ago, actually, in which we looked at a large array of the nanoparticles that I described with different chemistries and uh, DNA barcoded cancer cells, about 465 of these barcoded cancer cells. And we looked at the dissociation, these different surface chemistries, and also we looked at physical properties, different chemical and physical properties, how these nanoparticles interacted with these cells. And we actually found that there were key genes associated with uh, certain kinds of cancer cell uptake. Uh, so in this case, we, we needed to use uh, computational models to be able to break down um, the information that we had. We had a huge, we still have this huge data set and, um, uh, we, and we have genetic maps or libraries for every one of those DNA barcoded cells. And what allowing us to do and being able to use models that allow us to look at some of the key features in these uh, nanoparticles is uh, we're finding out that there are some design parameters we can learn from. If we want to design nanoparticles that will allow high amounts of uh, uptake by the cancer cells we target. And there are also potential biomarkers that patients may exhibit that would tell us whether a patient would be responsive to a nanomedicine approach. Yeah. Totally great. Well, um, I hope you can stay on. I know you're at the hospital um, and then we'll come back for more questions.